What happens when you hammer a square peg into a round hole? The hole begins to crack. The cracks expand. More cracks appear. And ultimately, the integrity of the structure as a whole is weakened. This is the analogy I've used time and time again for how Star Wars The Clone Wars fits into the expanded universe now called Legends. Hi, I'm Tad Larkin, but you're watching this on my Captain Fordo channel. And if you're watching this, you probably saw my video from a few months back. And if you haven't, go watch it now or you're going to be completely lost. See link in the description. It has come to my attention that perhaps a second part to my infamous Why the Clone Wars Doesn't Fit in Legends may be needed to clarify some things. So, at the request of a commenter on the aforementioned video, I went ahead and made a part two, elaborating a bit more on some of the conflicts and contradictions with pre-TCW established EU, as well as correcting some errors I made in the first video. As a note, from here on out, Star Wars The Clone Wars shall be referred to as TCW to avoid confusion. First things first, I'd like to correct the mistakes I made. No, Dooku did not get tired of Ventress. He was actually ordered by Sidious to get rid of her. And given how many times she was foiled by Kenobi and Anakin in the show, I don't really blame him. Yet, her exodus from Dooku's Dark Acolytes feels needlessly rushed. That's the sense I got from watching the show, and that's the sense I was trying to convey in the video. Next, this isn't really much of a correction as it is a clarification. When I use terms like basically and for the most part when describing Anakin's lack of character development in the previous video, I'm not saying he had no character development at all, I'm saying he had very little. The Mortis story arc was basically, there's that word again, basically, make note of that, the most character development Anakin received within the entire series, as it was Dave Filoni's attempt to give Anakin some sort of internal conflict. It did what the Nelvon cave scene in the original Clone Wars series did for Anakin, as well as what the Dagobah cave scene did for Luke in Empire Strikes Back. Ahsoka leaving the Jedi Order was supposed to be this big, devastating loss for him that was supposed to have been one of the reasons for him turning to the dark side. Yet, it was kind of anticlimactic, and watching the episode Padawan Lost, it seems even sadder for Ahsoka than it was for Anakin. It probably would have been far more devastating for him and gave his character even more of a drive if they killed her off. But don't you worry, I'll be touching on that later. The series focuses more on Ahsoka than it does Anakin, which is partially why his character development was lackluster, using a generous term. And it could have been solved if they just made him a Padawan at the start of the series instead of a knight and an already matured adult, which is weird when you think about it, because he's really supposed to be 19 at the start of the series. The rest of the errors were minor pronunciation errors, it's Sundari, not Suduri, that I caught after re-watching the video weeks later. But everything else I have either corrected on screen in the video with annotations, or I stand by firmly. I listed my sources in the description of the previous video, as well as in this video, so it's not as if I was pulling all of this out of thin air like some people may think. Matt Wilkins' review on The Clone Wars I relied on heavily, as he actually went through and watched all the commentary on the seasons, providing a viewpoint that I couldn't see just from watching the show, and since he himself is a fan of TCW, I count him as an unbiased source. In the previous video, I mentioned that George Lucas perhaps wasn't as involved with TCW as fans claim he was, and that Filoni basically did whatever he wanted, and I got a lot of backlash for this. Well, after taking the time to watch some of the featurettes that were up on YouTube, thinking maybe I'll see something that changes my perspective of George Lucas' involvement with the show, and surprisingly, I only found things that support my claim rather than dispute it. In the Season 5 featurette of The Wrong Jedi, Filoni says some pretty startling stuff about going against George Lucas' wishes. Like in this clip you're about to see, Filoni explains that he knew George wouldn't approve of a certain way he cut the episode, deliberately not showing what he intended to add when showing the rough cut of the episode to George. Every episode of The Clone Wars ends the same way with that ring out. But um, right. How many times have you been sitting at home 
watching the show and you get kind of, hopefully, if I've done my job, worked into a nice emotional state and then you're just smacked right out of it by that ring out. For years, I've been trying to get rid of it. <laughs> Not on every episode, you know, it's fine. But just on, on certain episodes, I thought this arc was the arc where it had to happen. And I knew it as soon as we re I read the scripts and as soon as George sat down and we kept the idea, I sat there and I thought to myself secretly, this episode's gonna fade out to black. I know George now. And I'm like, I, there's no way I can sell this to him when we watch it in a rough cut. It's not gonna happen. So when he watched the rough cut for the first time, I didn't put it on there. Cinematic decisions weren't the only thing Dave liked sneaking behind the big man's back, as you're about to witness. On the subject of a major plot point, the fate of Ahsoka, Filoni deliberately went against George Lucas's wishes and kept Ahsoka alive. I don't think it's a mystery that I've always been a bit more in the Ahsoka lives camp. And, and George has been very full on in the Ahsoka dies camp. I think I've said that before, if not revelation for you. He admits George wanted her dead, yet she lives, which makes one wonder just how much of the changes, retcons, and full-on misportrayals of EU events, characters, and cultures were actually George Lucas's ideas or Dave Filoni's. That much is hard to tell these days, especially with the current Lucasfilm leadership and their affinity for blaming and praising George Lucas whenever they deem necessary to get them out of a jam. On the subject of Ahsoka, I said in the previous video that she appears nowhere in pre-TCW established continuity, and apart from the TCW tie-in novels, comics, and games, that's true. She does, however, get a mention here and there in the LATER novels, but nothing major. You have to keep in mind that most EU authors had no idea what Ahsoka's fate would be. Most assumed death. I want to go even further, and say that I theorize that Ahsoka was not only a major Star Wars afterthought and never truly meant to exist within Star Wars, but for the most part is just a marketing strategy to open Star Wars to a demographic that Lucasfilm's executives may have believed to be lacking at the time, young girls. Ashley Eckstein, the voice of Ahsoka, spearheaded a whole Ahsoka-themed clothing line campaign specifically for girls and young women alike, claiming that this was finally a strong female character in Star Wars. This was a role model for girls to look up to. Newsflash, Star Wars has never, ever had a shortage of strong female characters. Are you forgetting Leia? Padme? What about the cavalcade of amazing female characters from the Expanded Universe? Nomi Sunrider, Mara Jade, Mirax Tarek, Bria Theron, Bastilla Shan, Jaina Solo, Siri Tachi, the list goes on and on! It doesn't help Ahsoka's case that the TCW movie was released almost exactly a month before Star Wars The Force Unleashed was, giving even further evidence that Ahsoka is just a marketing strategy. It's basically saying, hey there, Star Wars fan, you're excited for the Force Unleashed and getting to play as Vader's secret apprentice, right? Of course you are! So here, what if I told you that Starkiller wasn't his first apprentice? Now you're intrigued. And now, not only are you going to buy the game in a month, but you're going to watch this movie as well, and the subsequent show afterwards. Ahsoka is a marketing strategy, disguised as activism, and the only thing that kept her alive and well in the Star Wars continuity, and continues to keep her alive and well in the new canon today, was, and is, Filoni's massive hard-on for her. And as Filoni stated before, even George wanted her dead, which gives one the feeling that George is never too attached to her character in the first place. I also got flack for pointing out that Anakin being knighted shortly after Attack of the Clones makes absolutely no sense. I firmly stand by everything I said, and even wish to present even more evidence that this was not intended for Anakin at all. Star Wars, Jedi Trial, and all of the other official Clone Wars timelines, including the new Essential Guide to Chronology, place Anakin's knighting at 30 months after the Battle of Geonosis. As this Wikipedia blurb states, an official solution to the problem has yet to be established. 
meaning that most sources are still saying 19.5 BBY, while TCW is still saying 22 BBY for the official nighting date. If there is still no official solution to the problem, i.e. an officially established Clone Wars timeline, then, if, in our hypothetical scenario, Legends is ever continued, something has to be done to resolve it, which is why I'm saying scrap TCW from Legends. Who cares if Pablo Hidalgo retconned this in the Essential Reader's Companion? He is the biggest turncoat in the franchise today, spewing lies about the EU never being canon, and treating the Legends fans like complete garbage on Twitter. So why, in a hypothetically continued Legends timeline, should we acknowledge retcons from this bully, from someone who never even considered the EU valid, so he claims? Next, clearing the air with the Death of Mirai. First off, Death of Mirai wasn't even a species before TCW. The Witches of Death of Mir were comprised of various species, as they were originally all descendants from a Republic prison transport that crash-landed on Death of Mir some 800 years before the Battle of Yavin. A majority of the Death of Mirian witch clans were humans, in fact. Tenennial Joe was a major human Dathomirian witch character in Star Wars The Courtship of Princess Leia, the novel where Dathomir and subsequently the Dathomirian witches first appeared. Now, the same could and has been said about Dathomir as has been said about the new Mandalorians. That is, perhaps, what was portrayed in TCW was only one small region of the planet, and the rest of the witch clans and Dathomir's ecology exists as had been previously established. And again, just like I said with the new Mandalorian explanation in the previous video, I will go on to retort the same. TCW makes it pretty clear that the Night Sisters were the ones in charge, and that the Dathomiri were a species rather than a culture. Not to mention, the orbital view of the planet from TCW remains inconsistent with the description from Courtship of Princess Leia and the previous EU media. Same goes with Mandalore. I was called out once more when I inferred the unlikelihood that Ventress's Dathomirian parents would have been able to hide her on Ratatak, given the fact that it was on the other side of the galaxy. You have to remember, in the previously established EU, Dathomir was an isolated world. The witches had very little contact with the rest of the galaxy, no technology, and no spaceports. Even in some of the writings at the time, you can see the authors struggling with these new retcons introduced by TCW, especially in James Lucino's Darth Plagueis. Since Lucino was basically the curator of the Clone Wars multimedia project, writing the New York Times best-selling Labyrinth of Evil, there's one scene in Darth Plagueis that feels particularly not well thought out. Forced, if you will, out of necessity. Palpatine is in one of Dathomir's spaceports, now apparently a thing, for no real reason, we're told, and Darth Maul's mother basically comes up to him, says, Here, I sense you're a powerful Force user, take my son, don't let Mother Talzin get him, and that's it. That's how Maul comes into his possession now. So, why would such a fantastic author like Lucino write this chapter so... mechanically? It's as if he knows he needs to introduce Maul as Palpatine's apprentice, yet can't introduce him the way Palpatine originally found him on Iridonia because that's been retconned by TCW. While this was a necessary scene, it kinda stops the momentum of the story right in its tracks because of how forced it feels, then picks back up again at the end of the chapter, and is never referred to again in the novel. This is where story and continuity start to suffer, all as a direct contribution to TCW's presence in the EU timeline. Moving on to the next bit. Some feel that I need to go into more detail and give some more examples of contradictions and disagreements between pre-TCW sources and TCW sources, and that my previous examples were easily dismissible, or overlooked, so let's dive in, shall we? In much of the expanded universe, or Legends as it is now officially known, there were characters, vehicles, and organizations who were known to have gotten their start during the Clone Wars. 
Gilad Palian, who is a major figure in Timothy Zahn's Thrawn trilogy, as well as a lot of later New Jedi Order era and early Legacy era novels, was well established in the EU to have gotten his start with the Republic Navy during the Clone Wars. While Palian did have one part to play in the TCW tie-in novel Clone Wars No Prisoners, he doesn't appear in the show itself or the rest of TCW affiliate media for that matter. He does, however, appear in the Clone Wars multimedia project and a few issues of Star Wars Republic. Another key figure in the EU, as well as in the films, who was established to have gotten his career start during the Clone Wars, was Jan Dodonna. And like Pelion, he appears periodically throughout the Star Wars Republic comics, as well as Labyrinth of Evil. Yet, nowhere is he seen in TCW or in any of its affiliated media. I talked a little bit about ATPTs and Dreadnought Heavy Cruisers being used during the Clone Wars in the last video, but it is also established in the 1998 video game Star Wars Rebellion that Victory Class Star Destroyers were also first fielded during the Clone Wars. The Clone Wars multimedia project reinforces this through the Holonet News and CIS Shadowfeed updates that were popular on StarWars.com in the early 2000s, as well as Dark Lord Rise of Darth Vader and Coruscant Knights, having the Republic deploy their Victory Class Star Destroyers six months before they were supposed to, in order to respond to the threat the CIS posed by pushing into the core. No such ships appear in TCW or its affiliated media. Seems like nitpicking at this point, right? Pretty much. That's why I had originally left some stuff out of the first video, thinking the evidence I presented was sufficient, but I digress. Speaking of military pushes, one thing that the Clone Wars multimedia project portrays very well over TCW is a more realistic conflict. Throughout the Clone Wars multimedia project, galactic borders shift constantly, as the CIS makes gains or the Republic shores up its defenses and vice versa. And unlike TCW, the Republic actually loses battles, and they lose quite a lot. And when the Republic does win, they pay dearly with Ferric victories. At the beginning of the war, the Republic is losing. There are only 10,000 units of clones ready for battle, and no major capital ships end up being finished until two years into the war. Meanwhile, the CIS already had a fully organized military, and at one point even pushed all the way into the core worlds during Operation Dirge's Lance. Check out my video on Mandalore, The Clone Wars, and Overview. It gives you a better visual representation of the Clone Wars multimedia project, complete with animations. The only thing I do apologize for is my narration, as it was one of my earlier videos, but check it out for more information. Link in the description. TCW, on the other hand, basically remains confined to the Outer Rim, and no major border pushes are present, which is surprising seeing that the CIS loses quite often to the Republic. So much so, that I wonder how it even survived one year, let alone three years. It's basically the Republic and CIS standing at opposite ends, spitting at each other until Revenge of the Sith. How is it we can win almost every battle but still be losing the war? Next, we're going to move on to some more characters, who, like I explained in the original video, were fully flushed out in the Clone Wars multimedia project as well as other EU media beforehand, and then were subsequently portrayed radically differently in TCW, causing inconsistencies or straight-up contradictory behavior. Created by John Ostrander after being inspired by one of the background characters in The Phantom Menace, Quinlan Voss was a Kifar Jedi from Kifu, first introduced within the Star Wars Republic comics. If you want the full pre-TCW story of Quinlan Voss, there's a link in the description below for my video I did on Mandalore, but for now, here's the Cliff Notes version. Quinlan was born to the noble Voss family on Kifu, and when he was very young, he was taken from Kifu by Jedi Master Tholm after Quinlan's aunt, Tinte, murdered his parents and ascended to the throne of Kifu. Soon after, he began his Jedi training under Tholm, and what made Quinlan stand out from the rest of the Jedi students was his species' psychometric abilities, which, when amplified by the Force, allowed Quinlan to read images from objects and by simply touching something, he could get the impression of the person who last touched the object. He would later find out that he could also use this ability to touch beings and read their memories. Quinlan also grew up alongside Obi-Wan Kenobi, as Master Tholm and Qui-Gon Jinn were very good friends, and as a result, their two Padawans became friends as well. 
Quinlan's early years in the Jedi Order consisted of tracking down spice runners and criminals, discovering the Dathomirian witches as well as destroying their Infinity Gate, and discovering a young Twi'lek girl, Ayla Sakura, who would later become his Padawan. During the Clone Wars, Voss mostly worked undercover, and at the special request of the Council, was tasked with getting as close as he could to Dooku's inner circle. This meant Quinlan had to commit open treason against the Republic to prove himself to Dooku, to try to become one of his dark acolytes, betraying Republic information to the CIS, and even dueling with fellow Jedi Aiken Kolar. On a mission to Kifu, Dooku commanded that Voss kill his aunt Tinte, after she refused to have Kifu join the Separatists. Initially refusing, Voss was forced to touch Tinte, and from his psychiatric powers saw the murder of his parents as a result of Tinte, and, in his anger, murdered his aunt in cold blood. This, combined with his obsession for finding and eliminating the fabled second Sith, pushed Quinlan over the edge, allowing him to fall to the dark side. On Honiger, he faced his former Padawan and would have nearly killed Ayla if it weren't for Commander Bly's intervention and him coming to his own senses. His failure on Honiger was Dooku's last straw for him, and he eventually set Asajj Ventress and Tol Skor after him. At the Battle of Rendili, Voss links back up with the Jedi after running into Kenobi on a derelict vessel and gaining his trust back, only after helping him defeat Ventress and Skor. Quinlan isn't trusted by Tacey Tin at this time, but he ends up proving his loyalties after helping save Plo Koon and Jan Dodonna, winning the Battle of Rendili for the Republic. Voss is eventually accepted back into the Jedi Order, yet he still struggles with the dark side as he lets his continuing obsession with finding the second Sith consume him, leading to nearly falling again at the Battle of Sayalakumi, where he believes Sora Bulg, another fallen Jedi, was the second Sith. With Ayla and Tholm's help, he snapped out of it, and together they defeated Bulg. After Sayalakumi, Voss moves his troops to fortify Ba's Pity, then is reassigned to Kashyyyk, where he survives Order 66 and starts a family with Kayleen Hentz, a human female he worked with undercover. In TCW, Quinlan Voss is introduced in Season 3, Episode 9, The Hunt for Zero. And right off the bat, there's already a problem. The Hunt for Zero takes place in 21 BBY, and by this point in the previously established Clone Wars timeline, Quinlan is already deep undercover as one of Dooku's dark acolytes. In fact, he had already killed his own aunt by this point. He had fully gone over, so I think it's needless to say he wouldn't be let five parsecs near the Jedi Temple, let alone five feet. Obi-Wan is already groaning before Voss appears on screen. He talks not very highly of him and seems in no way looking forward to working with Voss on this mission. I'm sorry, but I've just been reading Star Wars Republic before the show even existed. Isn't Quinlan Voss supposed to be a good friend of yours? If so, why are you complaining like you got stuck with the weird kid as a lab partner in chemistry? Ah yes, but TCW fits fine within the EU, right? His personality is completely changed as well. In the source material, i.e. the comics, Voss is gruff and gritty, a very serious man. I mean, this guy has seen a lot of shit. Yet, in TCW, he's laid back and almost goofy. I'm sorry, but I thought I was going to be seeing Quinlan Voss today, not the dude. I mean, holy hell, he's Quinlan Lebowski. The only thing they managed to get right was his appearance and psychiometric powers. Well, that's your opinion, man. Oh, I'm sure you could spin it, move some dates around, try to attempt to make this episode fit within the rest of the EU, but at the end of the day, they're still two dramatically different depictions of Quinlan Voss. They basically aren't even the same character, much like the contrast between Luke, Jake Skywalker in the new canon, and Grand Master Luke Skywalker in Legends. We now have Quinlan Voss and Quinlan Lebowski. Before TCW, Barris Ophi was a Mirialan Jedi, who, after apprenticing with Master Luminara Unduli, was finally granted knighthood in 20 BBY after the Battle of Drongar, where she worked tirelessly with battlefield surgeons to heal wounded clone troopers on the front lines. Ophi trained as a Jedi healer, and dedicated her life to helping others. And just to give you a better idea of just how kind-hearted and peaceful Barriss Ophi was, her preferred method of lightsaber combat was Sorosu, the most defensive lightsaber technique. She never used her powers for offensive actions, always in defense. Again, if you want the full scoop on Barriss Ophi's pre-TCW biography, 
go on over to Mandalore and watch my video on Barris Ophi. And you guessed it, link in the description. TCW starts off portraying her character rather well, actually. The only thing is, they changed her age. At the time of the Clone Wars, she's around Anakin's age, in her early 20s. However, they changed her age to be closer to Ahsoka's age, as the characters were set up to become good friends, and this general theme carried on through the show. It was nice, actually. I could see Barriss befriending and tutoring a young Padawan. However, in Season 5, they took Barriss and spun her 180 degrees in the complete opposite direction, turning her into a scheming mastermind, orchestrating the Jedi Temple bombing and blaming Ahsoka for it. The reasons given for why Barriss bombed the Jedi Temple, i.e. the message she was trying to convey, was within what her character would think if she had chosen that path. But it was her actions that are way out of character. She would not harm innocents, she would not cause destruction, she would not commit an act of terrorism. She would have done a peaceful demonstration in place of all of this. It's as if the writers had a dartboard with pictures of random Jedi on it and said, Okay, let's throw a dart and see who bombs the Jedi Temple and blames Ahsoka for it covered their eyes, and threw blindly, thinking nothing of it. This is blatant disregard for their own story, not just the EU, so I can't think of any other way they thought having Barris do this would be a good idea. The worst part is, nothing is ever clarified as to her final fate. We see her get taken away after Ahsoka is acquitted of the charges, yet her death during Order 66 and her mission to Felucia with other fellow Jedi remains canon within the Legends continuity. I mean, even the Wikipedia curators have no blooming idea how to spin this, stating, for reasons unexplained, she remained in the Jedi Order. It's nonsensical! If I were someone new to Legends who read this article, I'd think, man, this is confusing, and of course I'd be turning away from Legends, finding the new canon more appealing. Which brings me back to the full circle of my overarching point, that TCW is damaging to the Legends timeline as well as the Give Us Legends movement's credibility, and others who want to see the EU be continued. And don't tell me, oh, well if Voss was accepted back into the Order, why couldn't Barris? Simple. Voss didn't kill any Jedi. Yes, he dueled with Aegon Kolar. Yes, he dueled with Aayla Sakura. But he didn't kill any of them. Barriss took Jedi lives and would no way be let back into the Order, making her operations with the Jedi and subsequent death on Felucia nonsensical. Alright, now this one's short. Chancellor Valorum. We all know Valorum was Supreme Chancellor before Palpatine was voted into office, so he needs little introduction. In Star Wars Republic, Dead Ends, a disheveled Valorum appears to bail Organa on Coruscant, claiming to have concerning information on Palpatine. Organa, who is already weary of Palpatine in the midst of the Enforcement Act, which has already taken away more liberties and given more power to the Chancellor, decides to hear him out and meets up with him. They meet at the Senate spaceport, but, instead of outing Palpatine, Valorum redacts his statements, tells him not to worry, just don't support the Enforcement Act at whatever the cost, and then he boards the Bodajef transport Star of Iskin. Bail watches the Star of Iskin lift off as it suddenly explodes, killing all aboard, including Valorum. The act is blamed on CIS terrorists. However, it was Palpatine all along, just trying to tie up loose ends. The event takes place in 20 BBY, in the middle of the war, shortly after the Battle of Jabim. In TCW, however, Valorum appears in one episode in Season 6, alive and well and retired. The episode in most of Season 6 takes place in 19 BBY near the end of the war. Sure, you could move some dates around, try to make it fit, but it wouldn't make much sense to the reader or viewer from a chronological perspective, seeing that the references to other Clone Wars multimedia project material within the comic would still place it near the middle of the war. Alternatively, moving events from the end of TCW to the beginning wouldn't make much sense either in the show's continuity. Lastly, just a little tidbit, Eeth Koth. Well, here's the thing. He died during the Battle of Geonosis as seen in Attack of the Clones. That shit's G-canon, the highest level of canon. The source book Inside the Worlds of Attack of the Clones confirms this, and apparently both Leland Chi and Pablo Hidalgo straight up told Filoni, no, he's dead, you can't use him. However, George gave him the go-ahead, apparently. Look, 
George could have approved of Filoni adding a flying bantha shitting rainbows with a fully matured adult Luke Skywalker riding on its back into its own story arc within TCW, and it still would make absolutely no fucking sense within the EU's continuity, and neither does Ethcloth still being alive. We've already established George stopped giving a shit after 2005, yet TCW fans will still try to find a way to spin it so that it fits within the continuity. And then when they can't, They'll just say, oh, well, George Lucas said it was okay, so it's fine. Oh, Jesus Christ. This, this, is, this, is, this is why I make these videos. Like, I can't, you can't make this shit up. They could have just used Agen Kolar instead of Eeth Koth. They're basically the same goddamn character. But no, it's like Filoni was actively seeking to contradict the EU and the films. After hearing all of this, you cannot possibly sit there and tell me that TCW fits irrevocably within the Legends continuity without destroying the previously established material. This is blatant disregard of the EU like I've been saying all along. Yes, I have conceded that TCW does contain some EU material, but look, it's cherry-picked. They pick what they like and include it in the show. Almost exactly how Lucasfilm under Disney's ownership today is cherry-picking EU characters, planets, and events, and either changing their names or rebranding them into their own canon. It's the same damn thing. Which leads me to believe, and put on your tinfoil hats, ladies and gents, because we're going for a crazy fucking ride, that TCW was written with complete disregard for the previously established material on purpose to prepare Star Wars fans for an eventual canon reboot, whether influenced by Disney's purchase or not. Now, you're saying, oh, you're crazy, but isn't it the least bit suspicious that TCW was the first thing that the Lucasfilm story group included in their new canon after the reboot? And with the Lucasfilm's rabid anti-Legends fervor these days, if TCW was such an integral part of the old EU, why on earth would they include it if that's what they were trying to get rid of? Oh, because of George Lucas's involvement with the show? Well, guess what? He was just as involved with Ewok Adventures, Droids, and the original Clone Wars series, as well as the Holiday Special. Yet none of those were included as part of the new canon, were they? Regardless of your feelings on any of the above-mentioned shows. Just some food for thought right there. If you're like me, I learn better through visuals, rather than listening to or reading something. It helps me get a better grasp on a concept if I can visualize it. That being said, I went ahead and made a graphical representation of the entire Clone Wars multimedia project timeline in rough chronological order, with the exception of the Star Wars Battlefront games and the Clone Wars Adventure comics. The only reason being because I just forgot them and was too lazy to remake the image. I also excluded the Holonet news updates and CIS Shadow Feed from Star Wars Insider during this time, as well as the other short stories that were published in Star Wars Insider, which means more could conflict with TCW, but for time-saving purposes, I left them out. Just keep in mind, there is more than what you're about to see here. You may notice the tangled web of lines, each leading to a different book, video game, comic, or DVD cover. Each one of those lines represents some sort of connection, be it a reference in dialogue, flashback, or simply the story sharing the same character or specific location as depicted in the connecting source. They are, in a graphical sense, the strong bonds between the EU sources that made the EU stronger. That I reiterated time and time again in the previous video. All media above the Clone Wars Multimedia Project are older media, published before or during the publication of the media within the Multimedia Project. The media below are media published after the Multimedia Project's completion, i.e. the release of Star Wars Episode III, Revenge of the Sith. In fact, including Revenge of the Sith, as there are plenty of references to the Clone Wars Multimedia Project within the film, for obvious reasons. What I'm about to do here is go through, one by one, each comic, novel, video game, and DVD, compare this established timeline to what is depicted within TCW, 
TCW and then systematically eliminate each source that conflicts with TCW in order to portray the effect TCW's presence in the timeline creates, thus illustrating the weakening of the integrity of the expanded universe for you to see visually. Now, with the TCW movie starting swiftly after the Battle of Geonosis, as described in the film's introduction, it's been given the leeway of about two months, as the start of the show is still on record as being 22 BBY, according to post-TCW sources. So, the media taking place any time before two months after Geonosis should, theoretically, be safe to remain. Wikipedia actually gives it about four weeks, which could even further compress these sources into an unrealistic time frame. However, TCW depicts Anakin as a Jedi Knight already by then, and it is implied that he has been a knight for some time. There are no congratulations on knighthood from any fellow Jedi he interacts with within the first season or the movie, so it's safe to say that he hasn't been freshly knighted, making it more likely that he was knighted immediately after Episode 2, and some sources even confirm this. So, technically, anything depicting Anakin as a Padawan, even before that theoretical two-month buffer zone, are gonzo. However, I'll keep some of them around for now, because there are other reasons why they can't coexist if TCW remains in Legends. For now, Galactic Battlegrounds and the Clone Wars video game are out. I'll get to the young Boba Fett novels next. With that, we do lose a few connections between Tales of the Jedi, Revenants, and The Force Unleashed. Because of TCW's handling of Boba Fett, we can pretty much eliminate all of the young Boba Fett novels, given that, at the beginning of the war, he was working with Count Dooku, who kind of took him under his wing after Jango's death at Geonosis. In TCW, he immediately hooks up with Aura Singh, which brings me back to the young Boba Fett novels, where Aura Singh is actually one of his rivals, and even attempts to kill him at one point. Next, we get to the first Clone Wars issue of the Star Wars Republic comics, and since it's part of the same overarching story of the entire Star Wars Republic series, each retcon and severed connection that I illustrate with these sources from here on out also loses a connection with the rest of the Star Wars Republic series, which was an integral part of the EU, as it connected a lot of the dots between Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones. This particular issue could still theoretically fit, as Quinlan Voss hasn't been undercover for that long, and this comic takes place in 22 BBY, before Quinlan's appearance in TCW, which was in 21 BBY. So, assuming one could miraculously reconcile or simply overlook the dissimilarities between the depictions of Quinlan Voss, it could still fit. These next three issues of Star Wars Republic have some of the same problems as before, i.e. Anakin is portrayed as a Padawan, where, if TCW is present in the timeline, he's supposed to be a knight by this point. Alpha 17 is also introduced in this comic. He is an ARC trooper who was trained by Jango Fett and put in stasis until he was awoken to fight in the Battle of Kamino, and ends up tagging along with Kenobi and Skywalker in the subsequent missions and battles. Anakin still being a Padawan, combined with the fact that TCW portrays ARC troopers as culled from the ranks of generic clone troopers and not specifically grown or bred to be ARC troopers, like in the Multimedia Project, creates inconsistencies. So, these will have to go to make room for TCW. As a result of this, we lose connections with the Jedi Apprentice series. Star Wars Jedi Mace Windu takes place early enough in the conflict where it could easily be moved to that mythical aforementioned two-month buffer zone before TCW is supposed to start. Next, Star Wars Republic, Issue 53, concludes the story arcs of Issues 50, 51, and 52, which I have already eliminated, where Obi-Wan obtains the antidote for the swamp gas bioweapon used on Oma Da'un after the Battle of Kamino. That being said, it would just be confusing to keep it within the timeline with no point of reference, so that goes. Republic Commando Hard Contact is the first book within the Star Wars Republic Commando series, which not only establishes commando tactics and life as a clone within the Grand Army of the Republic, but also establishes much of the Mandalorian culture, language, lore, and just overall world building for the planet Mandalore and the Mandalorian people. 
Because of radically different portrayals of the clones, Mandalore, the Mandalorian people, and the Mandalorian culture, which we have established in the previous video, the entire Republic Commando series is cast out of the proverbial swimming pool in the wake of TCW cannonballing its way into the timeline thus losing valuable connections between Star Wars Jango Fett Open Seasons, Star Wars Bounty Hunter, Star Wars Children of the Jedi, and Star Wars Legacy of the Force series. Next, the original Clone Wars series was always thought to go hand in hand with TCW, as George Lucas himself had originally said in 2005 that the series was supposed to be the 3D continuation of the original series. However, since its airing, TCW has become bloated, encompassing the entire war, introducing plot points and characters that were not present or alluded to in the original series, and overall contradicting the series, as well as the Clone Wars multimedia project accompanying it. Again, Anakin being Obi-Wan's Padawan throughout most of the series is contradictory to TCW, and characters like Fordo and Dirge don't appear in TCW or are even alluded to, added to the fact that the two series don't even synchronize with each other one modicum, a missed opportunity on Lucasfilm Animation's part. TCW is the greedy, ungrateful son who murders his father to take over the family business and run things his way. Rest in peace, Clone Wars. As a result of the original Clone Wars series being overwritten, we lose connections with the Jedi Apprentice series, Spectre of the Past, Dark Lord Rise of Darth Vader, Star Wars Empire at War, The Old Republic, and Revenge of the Sith. Like Star Wars Jedi Mace Windu, Star Wars Jedi Shock T I could easily see fitting into a TCW dominated timeline, as long as the events of the Battle of Brental 4 are moved from 21 BBY to earlier in the war, as in TCW we first see Shock T on Kamino and 22 BBY, and by 21 BBY she's still there. I don't see a problem with moving the date of this comic, so long as Jedi Mace Windu is before it chronologically as it takes place earlier enough in the war and doesn't reference events that put it in a specific time frame. As I mentioned earlier when talking about Quinlan Voss, Star Wars Republic issue 54 as well as the Star Wars Jedi Count Dooku take place from 21.52 BBY to 21.38 BBY, dangerously close to 21 BBY, in which the TCW episode The Hunt for Zero featuring Voss working as a Jedi with Obi-Wan takes place. Because, in these comics, Voss goes deeper undercover to establish himself as a member of Dooku's Dark Acolytes, fights Aegon Kolar on Nar Shadda, and falls to the dark side, it's unlikely he'd be palling around with Obi-Wan on a Jedi mission concurrently or a few weeks after these events. So, these comics are thrown out, losing connections with The Force Unleashed, Star Wars Republics Issue 20, and Star Wars Rebellion. Admittedly, because I have not read Shatterpoint in over 10 years, I'm a bit fuzzy on the details, other than the overall synopsis of what happened, and I don't have the time to reread the novel in all honesty. However, from what I do remember, it may be alright to stay, even in a TCW-dominated timeline. Granted, some dates may need to be moved around, provided there are no hard date references in the novel, which I cannot remember if there were at this time. Star Wars Jedi Ayla Sakura is next on the chopping block, and since this also depicts Voss still deep undercover, contrary to what TCW depicts concurrently, as well as Aura Singh being a major antagonist and winding up imprisoned on Uivu 4 by the end, contrary to TCW, which still depicts her as a free bird and mentoring a young Boba Fett, this comic is out. As a result, we lose a connection between Legacy of the Force. Star Wars The New Droid Army depicts Anakin as a Padawan, as well as Barriss Ophi as a Padawan by 21.17 BBY. Both are full Jedi Knights in TCW by this time. So, this goes bye-bye along with connections to Courtship of Princess Leia for the Dathomirian Witch Antagonist, and Star Wars issue number 30 for Metalorn. Star Wars Cestus Deception also depicts Anakin as Obi-Wan's Padawan, as well as ARC Troopers being genetically bred rather than chosen, so this is out too, sadly. 
Star Wars Jedi Yoda contains references to the Battle of Jabim, which I will get to later, giving it an exact placement on the timeline, after Jabim, which I had mistakenly put as before Jabim on here, and since I'm going to eliminate those in a second, this one will have to go as well. Next, the Jabim story arc of the Star Wars Republic comics, which is my favorite out of the entire Clone Wars multimedia project, cannot stay because, you guessed it, Anakin is a Padawan at this point in the war, which is 21.79 BBY, one year and two months after Geonosis. Not only does it have a strong frame of reference for when it takes place, but the length of the battle is over a month, making it unable to fit in that fabled two-month buffer zone, or four-week buffer zone that I mentioned earlier, as two and a half years worth of events are supposedly squished into that period. As a result of losing this, we also lose major connections with the Star Wars Empire comics and Star Wars Empire at War. Star Wars Republic issues 60, 61, and 62 all reference Jabim as well as depict Valorum's death that I explained earlier and establish Asajj Ventress's species and backstory, which were retconned by TCW. So these cannot stay. By losing these, we also lose connections with Star Wars The Old Republic and Darth Maul Shadowhunter. Star Wars Republic issue 64 connects with Voss's undercover missions for Dooku. And again, since Voss is established to be working with the Jedi at this time rather than Dooku in TCW, this also must be tossed thus losing connections between the Thrawn Trilogy and Star Wars Issue 27. The MedStar duology also has to go, again because Barriss Ophi is knighted in the novel which takes place in 20 BBY, and in TCW she's already a knight before then, not to mention the debacle regarding the Jedi Temple bombing. By removing it, we also remove connections to Darth Maul Shadowhunter. Star Wars Republic issue 65 and 66 also cannot stay because the end of the Battle of New Holstice is depicted where the Mandalorian protectors under Mandalore the Resurrector aided the CIS and attacked the Republic. In TCW, there is no Mandalore, the Chieftain, or Mandalorian protectors. There is, however, the new Mandalorians, who are depicted as the dominant government on Mandalore and are also neutral, and the Death Watch, who have already been destroyed in the established canon. So, this obviously cannot coexist if TCW takes precedence on the timeline. Which, real quick, something that I failed to realize in the previous video, if the new Mandalorians and the EU Mandalorians both supposedly coexist on Mandalore side by side, as Leland Chi said, why wouldn't the real Mandalorians have wiped them out centuries earlier? If there's anything I know about actual Mandalorians, it's that they wouldn't tolerate Dar Manda, no longer Mandalorians, living on their sacred homeland. Star Wars Republic issue number 67 can't stay because, again, there's a reference to the Battle of Jabim which places it smack dab in the middle of the war, which causes even more problems because Anakin is still a Padawan, and again, TCW depicts him as being a knight already by this time. Thus, we lose connections between Jango Fett, Open Seasons, and Tatooine Manhunt. Star Wars Republic issue 68 also won't be able to stay, because Quinlan Voss is still working with Count Dooku at this point, and has already fallen so far to the dark side that he now has a Sith Crystal in his lightsaber. Although he works together with Ayla on Honiger in this story, he betrays her at the end, nearly killing her, far from the Quinlan Voss we see in TCW around 20 BBY. And because of this loss, a MAJOR connection to the Thrawn trilogy, the whole backstory as to why Honiger was the way it was, as well as Star Wars Empire War Forces of Corruption, are severed. The next comic book series, Grievous, General Grievous' first ever appearance, also cannot coexist with TCW, as the comic takes place at the height of the war, two years after Geonosis, as General Grievous has already pushed far into the core world, where at this point in TCW, the CIS was already confined to the Outer Rim. Not to mention the fact that the portrayal of Grievous throughout the multimedia project is that of a ruthless general, a strategic mastermind, and a killing machine that wages total war against the Republic and commits atrocities that 
TCW can't exactly show being a kids TV program and everything, so TCW Grievous is shown as a cartoon villain who flees whenever his dastardly plans are foiled for the umpteenth time. At the loss of this series, connections between Empire at War, Young Jedi Knights, and Dark Forces are severed. Next up, I already established the fact that Jedi Trial can't exist with TCW still hogging up the timeline, because again, a major focus of the novel is the events leading up to Anakin becoming a Jedi Knight, and because of references to battles like Jabim and Argonar, the novel is firmly set to take place two years and six months after Geonosis, as opposed to immediately or four weeks after Geonosis, as TCW would suggest. Connections with I, Jedi, the X-Wing series, and Star Wars Rebellion are severed after throwing this novel out. Yoda, Dark Rendezvous, also ends up getting sacked, because not only does it reference Argonar and Jabim, but also the events of the aforementioned Jedi trial. So, this ends up going as well thus losing connections between Star Wars Rebellion and the Jedi Knight Academy. And I neglected to illustrate that it also severs connections with the Junior Jedi Knight and Battlefront Elite Squadron, so keep those in mind too. Republic issues 69, 70, and 71 depict Quinlan Vos coming back into the fold as a Jedi, the Battle of the Dreadnoughts of Rendili, and Phase 2 clones starting to be fielded. Again, Quinlan Voss was already back in the Jedi by this time in TCW, and the comics reference Obi-Wan and Alpha's escape from Ventress's castle on Rat Attack, material already retconned by TCW. So this has to go by default, as it references something that, in the eyes of Filoni, never happened. As a result, connections between the Thrawn trilogy and Revenge of the Sith are lost. Republic issues 72 through 76 also suffer as a result of TCW's presence in the timeline, as these comics depict the events leading up to and during the Battle of Seleucami. TCW moved the date of the Battle of Seleucami from 19.48 BBY to 21 BBY, and depicted Phase 1 clones during the battle, not Phase 2. In the absence of Apo Rensisis, Sora Bulg, and the Morku Kai clone army suggests that it's been paved over. Connections to I Jedi, the X-Wing series, and the Legacy comics are severed as a result of this. Routine Valor gets to stay, as it is more of an action-driven comic than a story-driven one, and no references to other multimedia project events leave it somewhat free to interpret when it takes place. Season 5, Episode 12 of TCW takes place during the Battle of Sarish, the same planet Routine Valor takes place on. This is perhaps the only time I've seen TCW give one iota of respect to the source material. Star Wars Obsession has already been entirely retconned as a result of TCW. Asajj Ventress no longer gets critically injured by Obi-Wan Kenobi and escapes to the Unknown Regions, and Adi Galea is no longer killed by Grievous on Boz Pity, she is instead killed by Savage Opress on Valorum. Now this one pisses me off, because there is a direct reference to both this and Republic issues 72 through 76 in Revenge of the Sith, when Obi-Wan mentions... Salukamai has fallen, and Master Voss has moved his troops to Ba's Pity. So now, direct dialogue in Revenge of the Sith references events that no longer happened since Obsession has been retconned, and 72 through 76 can't remain in the timeline because now of conflicts with TCW. Major connections to the Star Wars Jedi Starfighter game and comics, as well as Dark Lord Rise of Darth Vader and even Revenge of the Sith are severed as a result of losing Star Wars Obsession. Star Wars Brothers in Arms is also capable of coexisting alongside TCW, as, like Routine Valor, there aren't any references to other multimedia project material, setting the story at a specific point in the timeline, and since Anakin is already a knight, you could pretty much stick this anywhere. A lot of these later sources will struggle to fit within a TCW-dominated timeline, as Season 6 of TCW pulled out all the stops when it came to disregarding continuity as well as the established EU. In the case of the New York Times bestseller, Labyrinth of Evil, it's 50-50. Seeing that TCW doesn't directly lead into Revenge of the Sith, there could be some leeway in how many weeks or months there are in between the final episode of Season 6 and Star Wars Revenge of the Sith, 
which could leave some room for Labyrinth of Evil to fit chronologically at least. We simply don't know because Star Wars was rebooted before an official Clone Wars timeline was ever established in the old canon, or Legends. The only reason why I'm leaning towards its elimination is because there are references to Jabim, Argonar, and Praesatillion, all sources that are outed from the timeline in the wake of TCW's interference. And it would just be confusing to the person trying to keep track of this timeline if there were sources that referenced events that didn't happen according to TCW. As a result of losing Labyrinth of Evil, connections to Star Wars Annual Issue Number 3 and references from Revenge of the Sith and Dark Lord Rise of Darth Vader are severed. The Revenge of the Sith novelization, widely regarded as even better than the movie, definitely cannot fit within a TCW-dominated timeline because the book constantly references the events of Argonar and Jabim, as they were very traumatic experiences for Anakin, and gave the reader insight into his mind at the time, explaining some of the reasons why he went over to the dark side left out by the film. Not to mention the absence of inhibitor chips causing the clones to follow Order 66 that TCW introduced. The subsequent comic is also ousted because, like I explained earlier, Barris Ophi's death during Order 66 is portrayed, when TCW last showed her being carted off to prison, giving no explanation how she would have gotten back into the Jedi Order. Lastly, the final issue of Star Wars Republic must go. We see themes throughout the Clone Wars multimedia project, many of them we have already thrown away to make room for TCW, finally come to their conclusion. It would make no sense to the reader seeing Quinlan Voss start a family with Kayleen Hentz if all the comics depicting Kayleen as his partner were non-existent according to TCW. In the end, all we're left of the Clone Wars timeline is this. There you have it. It was a mouthful, and it took months of meticulous research and graphic design, but I finally did it. I have illustrated to you that TCW does indeed harm the timeline by retconning and decanonizing these sources that conflict with it, and the connections between older and later EU material have decreased drastically, all for you to see before your very eyes. And the one thing that bugs me is TCW fans will still believe that the series fits irrevocably within Legends and exists perfectly alongside the Clone Wars Multimedia Project material as well as other EU material. I have laid it all out for you to see, to visualize. I have pulled out all the stops. I have done the equivalent of taking a flat earther, sending them into orbit, and having them circumnavigate the globe a few times, and then having them come down still convinced that the earth is fucking flat. If you still 100% believe that TCW coexists perfectly fine within the multimedia project and the entire Legends timeline, you have superseded the point of rational thought into the realm of wishful thinking. On a more positive note, there was some good that came out of the video, as I received several reactions containing suggestions for how TCW could still be a part of the Legends universe, yet not conflict with it in any damaging way. One such solution was removing T-Canon from the hierarchy and placing TCW in the S-Canon slot for secondary canon. This would have some of the events from TCW still taking place in the timeline, yet, whenever a contradiction between TCW and EU sources comes along, the EU source would be accounted and the TCW source would not. Another way is what I mentioned in the previous video, have the events from TCW be falsified documents and cover stories perpetuated by Compnor to justify the Empire's actions and generally mislead the public while the events from the previously established EU sources proceed as had been done previously. Perhaps my favorite solution comes straight from Reddit, where it is hypothesized that TCW is merely a series of propaganda holofilms shown to Republic citizens during the war. Meanwhile, the Clone Wars multimedia project sources are what's actually happening. Mainly, the OG Clone Wars series is discussed in the theory. One only really needs to look at the intros to every TCW episode to understand where this theory comes from. 
epic fanfare music blares on screen. A charismatic announcer with a big booming voice narrates what's happening concurrent to the episode or summarizing what happened in a previous episode. Almost emphatically similar to U.S. Army propaganda newsreels during World War II. Perhaps even intentional. Galaxy divided. Striking swiftly after the Battle of Geonosis, Count Dooku's droid army has... America goes to war. Men of the Army, Navy, and Marines reinforce the battlefronts on six continents to save the homes and ideals of free men from Axis domination. From the other side, if you watch the commentary from Star Wars Clone Wars Season 1, creator Gendy Tartakovsky explains that the inspiration for his show's intro comes from wanting the audience to feel as if they're intercepting a transmission straight from the front lines of the Clone Wars. So this the idea behind the main title was that there was a battle transmission from some kind of war heading out throughout the universe. And so we caught it. It is human nature to dislike hearing something we don't really want to hear. And with TCW being such a smash hit show, influencing many's ideas of what the Clone Wars actually were, it's easily understandable that most people get upset or even offended when some person stands up and says, you know what? I don't think this show fits that well into the universe it was meant to exist within, as everyone says it does. Lucasfilm did a pretty good job of burying the media of the Clone Wars multimedia project back in 2009. So, not as many people were as exposed to it or remembers it as well as I did growing up apparently, but the media TCW replaced fits far better and is far healthier for the Legends timeline than TCW is or does. And if you can get a hold of that media, I recommend digesting it for yourself and see with your own eyes rather than listening to some tool, quote unquote, on YouTube. It's these continuity issues that TCW creates that makes Legends far weaker and is part of the reason why Disney Star Wars fans today say the EU had no consistent continuity. It did, just not after TCW created those major continuity errors. This hurts the EU movement and their plight to get Legends continued alongside Disney's story as an alternate timeline, much like Marvel has alternate timelines, or Star Trek, or even Legend of Zelda. And that's part of the reason why I made the video in the first place. Because I love Star Wars Legends, and I want to see Legends continued, and I want to see Legends continued in a way that's unique, and offers an alternative to Disney canon rather than something similar to Disney canon, i.e. both canons including TCW as the only thing between Episodes 2 and 3. Last thing I want people to remember is, at no point in the past video or this video did I say that TCW was bad or that TCW fans are stupid for liking it. All I'm saying is, it doesn't fit within Legends, and I'd even go as far to say as that it doesn't belong in Legends either. TCW is Disney canon. Disney's canon was practically built around and for TCW. It should stay within the Disney canon and let the multimedia project sources take their rightful place back in the Legends timeline. I said this in the last video as well. You can like TCW even if it isn't part of a hypothetical, let me reiterate, hypothetical continuation of Legends. And I think that's what a lot of the backlash from the previous video is from. Legends fans who love TCW and have hostile feelings towards Disney canon who can't bear to hear that TCW doesn't fit in Legends. I'm sorry to say, but it doesn't. And fortunately, I'm not the only one who sees it. You can continue to say that arguments I and others provide are easily dismissible and plug your proverbial ears, but I listed my sources. 
I have seen the entire TCW series, I have read, watched, and played, as well as own most of the Clone Wars multimedia project, and I'm a huge fan of Star Wars Legends with my own library of Legends material. After two videos on the subject, I am literally exhausted of ammunition. So, if this wasn't good enough for the critics, I do indeed sincerely apologize. There's actually really no sarcasm intended. Perhaps another who shares my same views on the subject can produce a better video, explaining what I'm trying to explain in a way that conveys these ideas in a more understandable way. In fact, I encourage it. Hell, I even encourage the critics to make your own video and explain why TCW does fit. That I would be interested to see. Preferably something other than, because George Lucas and Leland Chi said so, but I'm not really too confident. To the Disney canon fanboys undoubtedly commenting on this video, my last words are dedicated to you, in preparation for what you might say in response to the video. 1. The EU was always considered canon, despite what lies and propaganda the mouse likes to feed you. There are entire websites, complete with statements and actual quotes from George Lucas, Leland Chi, and various Lucasfilm executives and authors that are dedicated to debunking this myth perpetuated by Disney-owned Lucasfilm. I will list some in the description, and I'll make a whole hour-long video about that too if I fucking have to. It's nothing more than a silly myth perpetuated by Lucasfilm to delegitimize legends, probably because they aren't even too confident in their own story, the backlash from Last Jedi being a prime example. 2. I don't care if the new canon is better anyways, in your highly objective opinion. The subject of the entire video talks about TCW in Legends, and why it doesn't fit in Legends. I am not a hater, I don't hate the new canon, I'm just uninterested in it, as it's mostly derivative from Legends anyway, given the amount of cherry picking they do. All the new canon is good for, to me, personally, is to be a potential receptacle for TCW and keep it far away from Legends where it can't damage it, yet, at the same time, give it some form of legitimacy so fans can still enjoy it without being salty like me. And three, my hopes for Legends being continued aren't quote-unquote unrealistic, as there are scores of dedicated fans who fight every single fucking day to have Legends continued, through Hasbro Black Series figure fan polls, through the Jaina Solo pre-order campaign, and through Lucasfilm's own inevitable self-sabotaging. We will have Legends continued. Once Disney and Lucasfilm finally realize the money-making potential of continuing the legitimate Star Wars timeline. Thank you.